Welcome to the Honest Mamas Podcast, where we talk about the emotional and spiritual aspects of the motherhood journey. We are a team of honest mamas, myself, Melissa, Sophie, and Claire. We are psychotherapists, moms, and friends. Join us as we get real about the topics that matter to you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 48 of the Honest Mamas podcast. This is Melissa, and today I had the pleasure of interviewing Allison Perrier. Allison is an LCSW and offers support in business development for therapists that are looking to start out their practices. She started practices in three different cities and is an amazing resource in addition to being an incredible therapist. Today, we talked to Allison about how she balances and manages it all. Welcome to my conversation with working mama, Allison per year. Hey, Allison, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks so much for having me. You are such a busy mama, so I am so grateful that you made time to jump on here with me. And uh, we were just talking before we started recording and I was just feeling like, oh, I could just keep talking to you and having a conversation, but I guess we should start recording. So (laughs) probably, yeah, (laughs) (laughs) probably a good thing. So, yeah, yeah. So just to let our listeners know, I met Allison through her amazing, supportive Facebook page um, called the Abundance Practice Builders. And I know from that spot, you've done so many more things that you're also a therapist and an eating disorder specialist. So you've got a lot going on. You help people build their private practices. You do business coaching. And then you're also a mom. So for our Honest Mamas podcast, let's dive into how in the world do you handle all of that? Yeah. Well, I guess part of it is systems. Like I'm a total systems geek. And one of the things that I've really created kind of watertight kinds of systems around is my, my work time and my family time. So for instance, I leave my computer at home. Like I haven't checked my email yet today. So, or since Thursday, actually. Wow. Um, And we're recording this on a Monday. So I leave my computer at work. I don't have any apps business related on my phone. Uh Uh-huh. And what about, so whoa, 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 whoa. Let me ask you, what about, what about Facebook? Not on my phone. Are you serious? I'm serious because Facebook is work for me, really. Yes, like, agreed. You know, my group is it's over 8,500 people. So almost like I will probably have over 300 notifications when I finally <gasps> sign in. Oh my gosh. So it takes me a while to get through it, but I've learned, I used to do a little bit on the weekends and I just, I've played with a lot of different things. And what I realize is I am not present with my girls or with my partner or whoever else we're supposed to be present with, Mm -hmm. like friends or family, um, I'm not present with them if my phone is even in the room with me. So most of the time, unless I'm expecting a call or something, my phone is just in a different room while I'm playing or being being present with or without quotation marks, depending on what we're playing. So yeah, and that, that came out of a really intense conversation with my partner when he, he would frequently bring up how much I was working And then we'd watch a movie about a career gal or something like that. And he'd be like, oh, I'm so glad you don't work that much. (laughs) And I was so confused. And I was like, most weeks, with the exception of like building up to launches, I'm working less than 40 hours a week, which is less than most people. But what he was feeling was that I was constantly like my wheels were turning. I've got a business brain. I've got an entrepreneur mind. Like I'm always coming up with new ideas and fun things to do. and, And I love my work. But I found that I was really not really listening (laughs) or um, I would just bring up out of nowhere, like, hey, what if I did this in the business? And my husband would be like, we're building a castle right now. Like (laughs) (laughs) not a business castle. Right. (laughs) (laughs) So um, I realized like I I have to have really intense boundaries for myself, Mm. like and they have to be structural in the way that it has to be a little bit more motion or energy for me to to be on the business. So actually I do have one business app on my phone and that's Instagram because you can't add anything otherwise. I know. But yeah. But yeah, I don't look at it like that's part of why I keep my phone in the other room. It's just cuz it's it's the way that I'll be with my girls and it took me a long time and a lot of suffering to figure that out. So I I don't want to be like, yeah, no big deal. I just have it all. 
you know, down pat. <laughs> right, right. And it's so interesting too, because I'm I'm thinking about all the therapists that, you know, will probably listen to this too, that are moms or not, or just interested in what you have to say. And I'm imagining that some of them might say, but how can you not be available? What if there's a client emergency? What if, you know, this or that? Or do you struggle with the anxiety? Or did you, when you first started that kind of boundaried routine of putting your phone in another room, keeping, I mean, when you said you haven't checked your messages since Thursday, I get anxious. So how do you uh-huh. handle that? Well, it's not that I'm not anxious. Um, so I'll own that I do have anxiety over it. But it's I also don't have any high needs clients right now. Like yes. there's nobody I'm actively worried about. And if there was, I would probably be checking more often. But I think it's just like I have to choose between the anxiety of not being 100% present for work when I'm supposed to be with family or like my daughter repeating the same thing for the third time. Cause I'm not listening to her. Right. 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 And like, I'm just in a place now in my business where I'm realizing I've spent a lot of energy in my businesses mm-hmm. to the detriment of my family. Mm-hmm. And it never got to a point where, you know, like we were unhappy in our marriage or anything like that. But I think I just hit this wall where I was like, you know, the people who know me best and love me most are the people that are getting the dregs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I love my work and I love the people I work with, but I have to like, I have to leave enough for my family and for myself at the end of the day. Absolutely. There was a long span of time where that was not happening. And I was so much more irritable and snappy and just, I, I was chalking it up to, oh, I'm just not a kid person. Like having kids this age is really hard. And I think both those things are true on the surface, but I was using them as excuses and not kind of taking responsibility for, yeah, it's a lot harder when you're spent. <laughs> and it's so a lot true. Yeah. And, and I'm lucky enough that I'm my own boss in both my businesses. So like, guess what? I don't I'm have off. to suck. Yeah. <laughs> right. I can be a good boss and right. give myself time off. <laughs> That's amazing. That's, that is really encouraging to hear. And I also imagine that you follow it up with really having some good childcare in place so that you can be focused when you need to be focused, maybe during the week, you know, setting yourself up not only for time off, but also for time on. Right. Yeah. And and I'm really fully present at work when I'm at work. My phone is also away unless I'm expecting some like consultation or client call. And I do have it set up where I can see if I get text messages from my partner or daycare, but for the most part, it's quiet. When like, Today, my one and a half year old is sick. So I canceled my morning and my mom came to watch her since she can't go to daycare. So yeah, so it just gets, it gets handled. And I think there was a a time in the past when I would have been more dug in and Mm -hmm. been like, no, but my, my clients need me. Mm -hmm. Even if they're not high risk, even if they're kind of in a, a steady place, there was this sense of obligation. And just lately I've been very clear, like my my true obligation, if I'm going to make up obligation, I need to make up obligation for the people I love the most. Yeah. It's it's such a good, you know, as we're talking, I'm like, yes, awesome, amazing. And it's lucky that we both love what we do. We're both therapists. You know, we're business owners. We we love what we do. And we have a couple of businesses going at the same time while we're mm-hmm. still seeing clients. So it's a lot to navigate. And I'm also thinking of the people that might be listening who work for maybe, you know, another person or a corporate job. I mean, I've met so many other moms in the community that are doing things that they do not enjoy and how Mm -hmm. having a baby is such a kind of wake up call or a shift of like, wow, I'm actually going to spend money to send my child to daycare to go to a job that I cannot stand. Right. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about getting people into private practice who are interested in it. Mm. Because there's just such a, there's a freedom. Like you can be a jerk boss. I've definitely been a jerk boss off and on throughout both my businesses. (laughs) But for the most part, you call the shots and you can make it work in whatever way makes the most sense for you and your family. Yes. And like, there's just so much more freedom. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if we are to take a little road trip back in time mm-hmm. to when you first became a mom to your to your first little girl, mm-hmm. I'm wondering what that transition was like to all the moms that are listening who maybe are going to take the step of private practice after they have a baby or maybe have done it 
before they have a child or working, I mean, in any configuration, working at a job that they don't particularly enjoy for somebody else or they do enjoy for somebody else, for you specifically, what was that transition like? Were you a business person back then before you had your first child? Like, what was that like for you? Yeah, I had my private practice at that point. um, And we were living in Seattle and my husband was in school and his program was like, between the studying and the clinicals and all that, it was like 80 hours a week. So, oh my gosh. Right. Yeah. So I was the, the sole breadwinner and we'd, we'd moved to Seattle, not knowing, I think we, we knew a couple people, but they weren't potential referral sources or anything. So we moved in there and I, I started a practice and it took off and I felt really, really lucky. And all of our friends had had fertility issues. And so they were like, you know, don't wait for the perfect time. Start now. So I was like, okay, well, it's probably going to take us a year and a half or so to get pregnant. So let's go ahead and get started on this practice. (laughs) And I ended up getting pregnant our first month, um, which I know is extraordinarily lucky. Mm -hmm. And it meant my husband was still going to be in school when Adair was born. He was still going to (laughs) be like studying for clinicals and not employed. So Oh my God. Yeah. Wow. So so she, I had her in May and he wasn't going to be done with school plus studying for clinicals and taking his boards until October. And that's October is when he was going to be able to have, he'd already had a job lined up luckily, but it was going to be a while. So I knew that if I was going to take the kind of maternity leave that I wanted to take, I was going to have to save. And I'm a really, at that time, especially I was maybe a pathological saver. Um, so kind Is there of more, such a thing? <laughs> I would say so. It was definitely like more rooted in fear and scarcity. And it was mm-hmm. like money hoarding. Yes. So I just kept taking on clients and clients and clients. So by the time I was nine months pregnant, I was seeing over 30 people a week, which- Oh my gosh, Allison. Yeah. So for anybody who listening, who is not up on the research, private practice, usually you want to see 25 clients or less a week. Yes. To prevent burnout. But I was just in this space of like, I've got to, I've got to make money. I've got to save money. I've got to like take this time off. And so I went so hard for so long and then I had a dare and then I had saved up enough for well more than three months of maternity leave, but I was just going to take three months and then I got postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a mess there at the start. And I was really, really, really lucky that I had enough savings to take those three months off because I knew what was going on with me. I knew this was postpartum depression, but I wasn't trained in how to treat that. That's not my area of specialty. So Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I can't like, I can't get myself out of this. I need to get help ASAP so that by the time my maternity leave is over, I'm hopefully stable enough to get back to work. So can you, can we, can we pause there in your, in your story and just get a sense of what that was like for you for the moms that are listening and maybe are also in the same boat? What did, what did postpartum depression feel like for you? It felt like all the not enoughness I had felt in my whole life times a hundred. Oh, wow. I felt like I was letting everyone around me down, especially this precious little baby. So I felt connected to her, but like I was failing her. Mm. Uh, and we had breastfeeding issues, which I hadn't really anticipated. I feel like people just don't talk about enough. They don't. And they are so prevalent. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like almost everyone I know had some some breastfeeding issues. And um, I I think a part of my postpartum depression was this kind of obsession with it that like, it was not like formula is bad and wrong. It was like formula didn't exist. Wow. Wasn't even an option for you in your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't something that I'd ever judged anyone for. It was almost, it was literally like it didn't exist and I couldn't feed my child. Oh my gosh. And luckily I'm so grateful. One of my friends gave birth 45 minutes after I did. Um, (laughs) And she had, right. (laughs) She had an oversupply of milk and I had very little milk at first. And so we had kind of this like pony express where, It was like this exchange of bags of milk and bottles and amazing. So I always like think of my friend Amanda as kind of like the, the sustainer of baby Adair. Oh, incredible. Like no matter how much time goes by, I will always have this incredibly tender spot in my heart for her. Mm. And that, that's another thing we don't talk a lot about milk sharing. Yeah. It's a thing, man. And it's beautiful. (laughs) It is a thing They actually in in the town that I live in, Westchester, just north of New York City, they just, this woman here just opened up her very, you know, one of the first milk banks. And I used donor milk when I first gave birth to my first child. 
And it was incredible. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. There are so many mothers out there who have way more than they need for their child and, you know, can be really be put to good use. So Mm -hmm. it's great to hear that. Yeah. And my Amanda's sister-in-law ended up donating milk too, because she had a baby, I think a couple months later and was, you know, she had plenty of milk. So it was just like, this like band of mamas, yes, right? This, yes. It was that village idea that that we so rarely have in our culture these days. So how did you come out of the postpartum depression? I mean, can you give us a little bit more about how you navigated through that and, and how you knew you were sort of coming out of that a little bit? Yeah, I think when all of a sudden everything started clicking, like once I had my second child, we realized what was going on. I just have like my milk comes out super hard and super fast, apparently. And babies under six weeks really can't handle it. Mm -hmm. So she would choke, she would clamp down. So like I was bleeding through bras and shirts and just kind of like trudging forward because I'm a, I'm naturally a trudger. Like, uh, I will make it work. I will force it to work. No excuses. Like that's kind of my MO. But that's also why, that's also why you're an amazing entrepreneur. Yeah. It's like that shadow side of it, yes, right? Like yes. it's really easy for me to work really hard and it's very uncomfortable. And that's where a lot of the anxiety comes in for me to take a step back. Mm. So, so yeah, I just trudged. And then all of a sudden Adair was big enough to handle my milk and it all, and she got some cranial sacral therapy and all of that kind of righted. And within two weeks, all of a sudden it was like the depression had lifted. Wow. Um, and I'd gotten help. I had, um, started seeing a therapist who specializes in postpartum depression or perinatal mood disorders and had like the prescription for Prozac that I was waiting to fill. I had by eight weeks, if I need to, I will fill this. Mm -hmm. And I'm a timeline person. Like if at eight (laughs) weeks, this I'm still bleeding through my bras, then I'm going to go to formula. Yes. I had all of these different eight weeks was like a thing for me. Mm -hmm. And so luckily it lifted a lot easier than some of my friends have, you know, experienced the recovery from their postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. And then it was kind of like this, this weird memory, this weird start to motherhood that I kind of had to grieve that I didn't, I mean, I, I'm sure people really do enjoy those first couple months in addition to it being a crazy haze, but I really missed out on a lot of the sweetness. Mm. And so there was some grief there. Absolutely. Was that just, just curious if that was different your second time around? A hundred percent. I was totally geared up and ready for it. I, I was, you know, helping people build their practices at that point. And I had already worked with most of the perinatal mood disorder therapists here in town. (laughs) So I was like, you were group prepping email. yourself. <laughs> I was. And I was like, group email, who do I not know? Who can be my therapist if I need it? Like, right. Give right. me referrals. <laughs> so I was totally ready for it. And we did have breastfeeding issues, but I was like, this hurts. I need another lactation consultant. Mm. Like, and we were, I think I saw four different lactation consultants within the first five days of her life. Amazing. So I was like, you know, get me a nipple shield, get me whatever. Yes. I just need, I need this to be okay. Yes. And I, I, had an undersupply again. And another friend here, um, had a son that's three months older. And so she gave me some of her milk and we went to formula. I also bought formula while I was pregnant. Cause I was like, I need to remember this exists just yes. in case. Amazing. So yeah, I just did everything I could to protect myself. <laughs> it really, I, I think it is, and it can be so transformative, you know, the, the areas of which we feel maybe that we missed out on the first birth, how it can be so beautiful the second time around where we really kind of know what the the little minefields might be. Obviously, every birth and pregnancy are, are different, but I love hearing that you set it up in a way of like, okay, these are the resources I've needed in the past. These were kind of the issues I had. Who can I ask? What can I get? I mean, even buying the formula before you gave birth, just to have it in the house. Yeah. Seems like it would bring down some of the anxiety. Totally. And we also, the the doula we hired, we hired partly because she was also trained in cranial sacral. And she's like, yeah, we can build it into the package where I'll come out and do cranial sacral, like, oh. you know, immediately after birth and then on my two day visit and all that stuff. So amazing. We just, yeah, I'm very like forewarned is forearmed. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Amazing. And I'm curious for you, Allison, how the balance, you know, you talked at the beginning of this podcast, kind of some tools on setting boundaries and where you are now in terms of navigating, turning work off. But for the entrepreneur, I'm sure, you know, you didn't always have so many followers and you didn't always have multiple businesses. And 
I'm just trying to get a sense of, you know, as you're having children and your businesses are taking off, what that was like for you. Yeah. Well, I think luckily I, when I had a dare, I'd really already built my private practice to a solid enough place that two weeks after I got back, I was full again. So that was like a humming motor. Mm. Whereas, so with, with abundance practice building, which is my business consulting business, I guess it had been around a year and a half, two years, maybe when I had June and it's just a lot more work than a private practice, to be honest with you. So there were a lot more moving parts. I've literally blogged every single week for three and a half years now. Are you serious? Um, Did you take yeah. a break when you had children or no? I didn't. I, um, <laughs> I, cause all of that was for abundance. I know. Right. Cause I can trudge. There's, there's just, a part of me that's like laughing, like you're crazy. And then there's another part that's like, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, And it's that dichotomy and me right. too. Of like, I get really proud of things that are really just rigidity. <laughs> I, I recognize that because I have the same parts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think with that, like I stockpiled, I did a bunch of blog posts before I gave birth. So I just scheduled them out through my maternity leave um, and just picked back up once I got back. So I wasn't actually working during my maternity leave with June, but I was thinking a lot mm. about, work, you know, and I was mm -hmm. managing the Facebook group and all that while, you know, she napped or played or bounced or whatever. And that was one of the times I was like, okay, I need to take Facebook off my phone. Like <laughs> I'm missing things. I'm not, I'm not here. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious for you, like now you're in a place where you can say, okay, I can turn the phone off. The apps aren't on my phone, except for Instagram. I don't check my email during these hours. I'm working these hours. I mean, it sounds like you have such a good flow and it's amazing too, for me to hear and for our listeners to hear that not only are you successful, but you also somehow managed to get it all done? You know, and I know so many mamas that are like, but I can barely, you know, make a meal, take a shower and get to bed. So women that are struggling with that piece, any thoughts that come to mind that might be helpful for those mamas that just feel like they're just not able to get their SHIT together? <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, a lot. And for me, it really is just holding those time boundaries and I'm trying to be okay with my house being a mess, but I'm not so great with that. Um, so basically what we do is we have decided to invest in somebody who cleans the house once a week. She doesn't like tidy, but the fact that she's coming the next day and I want to make the most of it since I'm paying for it, right. we do like a big, all right, guys, let's tidy up the house thing on Wednesday nights. And so I've been through this whole revolution and actually this weekend had this huge shift around the whole meal thing. Mm, tell us. Yeah. So, okay. I was doing Blue Apron for a long time. Me too. I love. It's delicious. It's great. And it takes me an hour and a half to make every one of those meals. Agreed. I'm a super slow chopper. And so I was like, <laughs> okay, this is not working because we get home at 530. We carpool a lot. So we all get home at 530 and then like bedtime routine starts at seven. So mm -hmm. that doesn't really set us up for success. So we went to Tara's kitchen mm -hmm. and where everything's already chopped for you thinking, okay, well that solves it. And then while like making a really delicious Tara's kitchen meal this weekend, I was like, I am the boss. <laughs> what if, like, what if I got off at four wow. and I went home oh. and I like made dinner. I love to cook. Mm. And what if I just like turned on some music and had some like quiet kitchen yes. time Yes, and made the food that I want to make for my family right? without it being rushed and stressful. And oh my God, it's 6.50. How are we going to like shove this into their mouths so right. they can get to bath, <laughs> right. you know? And so now I'm like, okay, so I'm going to I'm going to steer the ship. It's going to take a little while for me to get my schedule where I want it because I'm booked out. But I think that's going to be the new thing is I'm going to get off at four instead of five and have a little downtime. It's amazing. So, yeah, it's, it's funny how, I don't know if I'm still stuck in like the agency work I did a million years ago where there's a learned helplessness piece of mm. like, oh, well, I have to do this. Right. When like, I, and my husband has said this to me a million times. I'm like, you're the boss. And I'm like, yeah, but I have so many things to do. Right. But like, what's the point? What's the point of doing all those things and building this thing if my family gets the drugs? So yeah. agreed. Agreed. And I think you speak to the heart of a lot of entrepreneurs, myself included, that feel like, you know, we have put 
blood, sweat, and tears into our businesses, even if you're not in the you know mental health field, if you're an entrepreneur of any kind and you have worked so hard, it's been a party of one perhaps or a small team or small group. And I've heard this so many times, you know, whether it's from you or from other people in the industry about how to sort of get out of your business, stop working in your business and work on your business. Is that right? Did I get that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and so and so there's a part of me that when you say that, it's like it doesn't even occur to many entrepreneurs to set boundaries because there is so much potential fear of like, well, what if I don't get that paycheck or what if I don't get that money coming in or what if I miss something or what if I don't, resp-? you know, it can just spiral. Mm-hmm. And so what I love hearing from you is there's a way that you kind of take your power back in that moment and you trust and that you believe you've worked, you know, so hard to create this kind of momentum in your business that you can get off it for. You start to set yourself up for success, you know, so that there can be balance versus constantly feeling like you're reacting to your life and dinner times and bath times. Right? Yeah, totally. Because I feel like my whole year, honestly, has been reacting until the last couple of weeks. Mm. Cause I did that like, Oh, I've got this great idea. And instead of giving myself a measured amount of time to complete it, I'm going to do it all in two months. So I, you know, I was working 60 hour weeks for two months. I was waking up at five and going downstairs and working until the girls got up at six 30 and like then doing all that and then going to work and then coming home and all the cooking. And I mean, I was in this space of like victimhood around only having like maybe an hour a day of downtime Mm. as if I wasn't the creator of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew I was, I, but I knew in a way of like, Oh, I made my bed and I have to lie in it kind of a thing instead of a, yeah. And you can change it and you have agency and like you can make this beautiful instead of being upset about it. And so on that thread for those women that are working in careers that they cannot stand or do not like or have been dissatisfied. And and they may not, again, be in the mental health field. But what would you say to them? I would say get really clear about what you want. And that's a that's a evolving thing for me. Like it that's why I'm like, oh, I should get off early because before that's not what I wanted. Mm. And so I would say like spend at least an hour every month just journaling about what you want for your life. I love and that. that might like go down into like family stuff the whole time, or it might go into business stuff, but I've gotten so like, how do I produce? How do I get more and more effective and efficient? I've been in that realm all year. And what I've discovered about myself, and I knew this before, let's not act like this was all new information, but I'm actually doing something about it now, (laughs) um, is that when I create space, I fill it with something else. And it's like, you know, like I created some space in my schedule. I have an amazing assistant who has made my life so much better. And so I was like, okay, well then let me create a membership site, which is like the hardest thing to create (laughs) and maintain in the business world. Yes. I can sell a product all day long, but this is like an ongoing everyday selling a product all day long, basically. Yes. And so I built that to create more space And what it did is it created more space and more income. And then my initial reaction was like, okay, what do I put in that space to create more income? You are so right, Allison. I'm so glad you're saying this. Yeah. And I have this thing about unfulfilled potential where like my, like looking at my projections for the business, I discovered earlier this year that if I do all the things I want to do, like I'll have a million dollar business in 2019. Amazing. Amazing. And like to do that, am I really doing what I want to do? Right. And what is the million dollars really about for me? Probably just ego. Cause it's not like all that's going to my family. Like once you get to that price point, so much more of that is going into your business and you're not making that much more as an entrepreneur. Right. And so like, I've been pumping the brakes lately and being like, is that what I want? Do I want to do that kind of work just to say I've got a million dollar business or is what I'm doing plenty. Like I'm making so much more money than I ever dreamed of making ever. Like, I, I mean, I didn't have high hopes for income to be honest with you, <laughs> but, but then when I was like, Oh, I can make a hundred thousand dollars. Oh, I made a hundred thousand dollars. Oh, I can like triple this. This is amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, incredible. Like, Allison. It's like, what's, what's the point mm-hmm. aside from having a really good looking bank account or spreadsheet? Cause I don't know, like, it's just not, 
it's not producing in the last several months, it has not produced the kind of life that I imagined somebody with this level of business would have. And I think it's because I bought into the hype yeah. of like have an online business and you, you know, have this laptop lifestyle. And like, I don't want to be on the beach with my laptop. I want to be on the beach with my family, right? <laughs> yes. And I, and I've just been sitting as you've been talking, like how much of that shifts when you become a mom? I'm not going to say it's like the only time you have this self-reflection to be like, am I really enjoying what I'm doing? But I know for me, and I know for so many other moms, when you have a family, the perspectives shift. Mm-hmm. Usually, and especially when you're running your own business and you're loving what you're doing, it can pull you in, you know, pull you in more directions of like, well, I have an extra hour here. Maybe I could just do a couple of things or, you know, you're constantly on your mind is constantly thinking. And I think, you know, it's tough to kind of pull yourself back and say, what is this all for? Am I, am I enjoying the process of it? Or am I just trying to get to some magical finish line? And then when I do get there and I triple my income, for what? Have I been able to see my children grow up? Have I been able to be present with them? Or have I been a total moody person that's completely under rested? Yeah, absolutely. And like, even though I was working most of the time, I'm working like really good hours. Like I just wasn't present Mm -hmm. when I was home. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's because I kept feeding that ego, like that ego based piece of it. Yeah. Yeah. So I have to get specific before we end, because now there's another part that's like, if I was listening to this, I would want to know. So I'm going to ask you, (laughs) Yeah, how many hours do you set yourself for work during the week? So right now I've got one clinical day. So usually on Mondays, I just do clinical work. um, And I've got like seven clients that I see on Mondays. Mm -hmm. And then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I work from about 8.30 until 5. Great. Okay. And then I'm taking Fridays off as of two Fridays ago, I've reclaimed my Fridays and I've got the weekends off. So I kind of just like close my computer and put it in its spot in my office at five o'clock on Thursday. And usually I'm back by eight 30 on Monday. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Allison, this is, this is incredible. And I think we'll give a lot of hope to others listening that, you know, feel like this is just not possible. So yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll own, like, I really thought that was not possible. Like I was actually lobbying to my husband why that was not possible just a couple months ago. So <laughs> like I'm a new convert. Right. <laughs> I used to live here. Like when I had my private practice, I always think about like the most calm, sane version of myself was, was pre-kids <laughs> probably by right. design. Um, pre-kids when I was living in Seattle and had my private practice and I knew how to be still and I knew how to be quiet. And I could have long expanses of hours without filling them. And I just, I know that I can get back there without the anxiety layered on top of it, which is where I'm at right now. And I just have to keep practicing it and doing the next right thing. And you take Fridays off completely for yourself. No children, just you, no work. Yeah. They're at daycare during the day. And so I'm like starting to pick up hobbies again, like I picked up my guitar for the like 70th time in my life. Um, (laughs) Like I keep hitting this one level and then something will happen. But I don't think I've played my guitar since my oldest was born and she's four and a half. Wow. Which will tie us nicely before we end. Just to hear right before we got on, you know, recording, you were talking about some life changing book. And I'm curious if you'd mention that and just share a little bit about what's been helpful for you. Yeah. So it's Present Over Perfect by Shauna Nequist. And for anybody out there who is not Christian, I want to put it out there because I almost set it down a couple of times because it's very heavily, I guess, Christian oriented and I'm not a Christian, but I just kept, I'm, I trudge, right? So <laughs> <laughs> trudging through the so, book you I, go. <laughs> I trudged through some beliefs that didn't necessarily align with mine, but it was such an amazing book. Mm. And one of the things that really stuck out, she tells the story where she was hanging out with two pastors and one was a young pastor with this church that had just exploded. And he was saying like, I don't know, like, I can't stop it. The, it's growing so fast. And the other pastor was like, well, you can just own that. Like you built this, this thing that's growing so fast. And he's like, yeah, but like, we can't keep up. And like, basically was saying like, I have no control over this. And the other pastor was like, well, you kept putting out chairs. Ah. Uh. And I was, and she's like, what chairs can you take away? Mm. And I realized like, that's what I've done in my business. I just keep putting out chairs. Mm -hmm. Um, And she also talks about quick love versus like real love and how I have a large audience. And I really 
genuinely care about my audience and I want to be useful and I want to be helpful. And I get a lot of quick love from my audience because we're therapists and we are mm-hmm. pretty emotive and appreciative. And so I get a lot of quick love from them and that that feels good. And I think that there have been a lot of times in the last few years that I've mistaken that for the real abiding love that my partner and my kids and my family and my friends give me. Very true. And so just being like clear that I don't, what's felt like I owe my audience because they've been so kind and so loving to me has been to the detriment of my family, who is also kind and loving to me and in a more real way. Mm-hmm. So if there's something that has to get a little less of my attention, it needs to be my audience. Yes. Very, very true. And lastly, what are you most proud of as a mom? Oh, I'm most proud. Like my four and a half year old is the kid that like when there's a new kid in class, Mm -hmm. she'll hold their hand and show them all the good toys and like, like make them feel welcome. Mm. And that is, that's kind of just a tenant of who I want my kids to be as kind and welcoming to people. And who obviously they must have learned it from somewhere. So I I want to claim it. I don't know. (laughs) I want to claim my husband's very much that way too. I think we've modeled it as best we could, but I think it's also just her little heart. She's just like really tender. Mm, So beautiful, beautiful. Well, Allison, I could chat with you for another hour, but how can people find you if they want to learn more about you, if they want some more amazing support? And I will absolutely vouch for joining the Abundance Practice Builders Facebook page and anything that you do, I would endorse support because I totally think you're a rock star and amazing at what you do. So how can people get in touch with you? So Abundance Practice Building is my primary website and I've got the Abundance Party as well, which is spelled like Abundance Party, but it's I say it with more fun. Um, <laughs> Both those places, most of the resources are at AbundancePracticeBuilding.com, but then the Abundance Party has some fun stuff too. Amazing. Thank you, Allison, so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us for today's conversation. I love this conversation with Allison, and I walked away with a couple tips that I'll be implementing into my working mama life right away. If you'd like more information and to continue this conversation, join us over at Facebook, www.facebook.com forward slash honest mamas community, where these conversations and way more will continue.